So this first class, I'll be looking at what are some of the, the challenges and some of the things that have to be done when you're teaching the first human rights class to students? So this is the first human rights class for students, not your first human rights class. Because teaching that first class can be quite challenging. And so we're gonna look at how to set up this class, how to address those first difficult issues. And what are the kind of the important topics and concepts and ideas and arguments to engage with in that first class? So I've based this on, you know, the first, um, my the undergraduate course that I teach, which is called Introduction to Human Rights. And I've been teaching it now for probably 20 years. But this is looking at, at that the first class and teaching the basics in terms of, of human rights. Okay, because when we look at it, teaching human rights, it's a very interesting course to teach, but also it's a bit challenging in many ways. You know, we know that like 20 or 30 years ago, there was very little human rights taught. There's not a lot of human rights knowledge in the general academic community or in, um, you know, among high schools. So one of the challenges is that students coming to this first class would have never studied human rights. Now that's made more difficult because they probably read about human rights every day on the internet or they hear it in the news or people talk about human rights. So we have this huge discussion about human rights in the community, but very little knowledge about human rights among students. And that means there's gonna be lots of misinformation about it. So it means that the first class, a lot of that is going to be kind of correcting um, people's ideas about human rights, giving them, um, uh, discussing the misinformation there, and just trying to get them to know more about what human rights is and what it isn't. Okay, so that means you've got to deal with that misinformation and the criticism. The other, the other issue is that human rights does have a lot of critics. You know, at least half the stuff they hear about human rights is probably negative, probably critical of human rights. And, you know, and it's going to be more so in some countries. So it means a lot of that first class, you may have to be defending human rights as well. And this is against the ideas about negative views of human rights from some traditional and religious views. Say that may see that human rights is taking away cultural values. Or they don't believe in the full equality of, um, of, of gender, or that may have kind of inherent or subtle forms of racism or other forms of discrimination against non-citizens or people of a different color or disability or whatever. And also another major challenge is against political conservatism. We know, you know, particularly Malaysia has had a long history of being critical of human rights. We know Myanmar now, human rights is not a very safe topic to be teaching. You know, but at least we know that in the future you'll be teaching human rights because human rights is going to stay around longer than a uh, military dictatorship. So we have all these challenges. But against that is, in terms of human rights, just the fundamental issue that everyone should know their rights. You know, this should be core curriculum. It's just wrong that most students graduate university without being without learning human rights in the classroom. You know, the, the states themselves have said that they've agreed to teaching human rights, have made it a part of their commitments as, as it being a part of the UN. And just to make society function in a, in a civil way, to make society function in a just and peaceful way, that's only gonna work when people know their rights and people advocate for their rights and people respect the rights of others. Okay. So there are quite a few important reasons why you know, human rights should be taught. So what we're going to be looking at here in terms of how this session is structured and also what we're gonna do is firstly, we're gonna cover some of the content or knowledge that should be taught in the class. And these are things like you know, just telling students what are human rights, and what makes human rights special or different than other forms of rights. Looking at how, how human rights work, and this is mainly about what makes a right a right, 
for what's why we have those rights and why we protect those rights. And also it's important they know some of the main concepts that make rights special. And here this is things like universality, for example. The concept of universality is very unique and very important to human rights. And it's um, so that makes it important that students can grasp that and can use that concept. And it's also useful for students to have enough knowledge they can engage in debates. They can debate and discuss and argue different issues with human rights. So when they go out in the world and they hear people criticizing human rights or getting it wrong, they can discuss that and clarify the ideas about what is and isn't human rights and so on. Okay, so these are some of the content that I think is important for the first human rights class. What now the next important one is the process about how we teach that. Uh, now we'll be discussing this a bit later when we talk to curriculum, but just standing at the front of the class and lecturing students and pushing out all this information and hoping the students absorb that is not going to work. You know, there has to be a process in which they, they actually learn. It's not so much, you know, part of this is how you teach, but importantly, you've got to see how do students learn? What's the most effective way to teach this stuff so you know they actually learn? Because it doesn't make any sense if you just lecture 100 students and only three or four of them understand what's going on. That's wasting everyone's time. You want to make sure that, that process of teaching engages them, interests them, makes them listen. But importantly, they walk out of that classroom having learned something. Now, there's two elements to that. One that's useful is actually teaching what we call teaching through human rights. So using some of the basic principles of human rights in the classroom so they learn it and, and practice. And I'll come back to that soon. You know, making sure that the, that the classroom is a democratic space is an important start. Now, this is a challenge throughout Southeast Asia. Most classrooms are not democratic spaces. Most classrooms, teachers are the dictators. Teachers are at the front dictating the knowledge to the students. Now that can be okay and students can learn, but it's not a good setup. It's not a good start if you want them to be learning about human rights. So we have to democratize the classroom, make sure students feel that there's a sense of participation and engagement and discussion and so on. Now, how this is done in terms of learning theory, we talk about this as student-centered learning. The learning is centered on the student, how the student learns and what the student learns. Now, the last issue here that we'll be, that we'll be um, talking about is challenges for teaching that first human rights class. How you deal with the common challenges, the, the difficult questions. And so we'll look at that and have a discussion of that soon. So we're just firstly looking at the content of the human rights. So this means in this session, we're looking at the content or the knowledge here. So in terms of the content, the early class, one of the important things to, to address is firstly defining human rights. You know, what is a human right? What does it mean? Now, in terms of definitions, I find that it's useful to show that there are a couple of ways to understand human rights. There's like the easy way, which is these are the rights you have by being human. And it's probably the most common way that people define them. Now that's good. And that comes out of a, a natural law idea about human rights. By natural law, it means it's something that's kind of exists in nature or it seems so obvious that it just is what it is. And that is very useful because like when you do talk about human rights around the world, most people have the same idea of what human rights are. As I'll turn to soon, I often ask a, a question of getting students to list human rights as an early exercise. And I find that no matter where I am, no matter the background of the students, most people know most basic human rights. Most people off the top of their head could name about half the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And with a bit of prompting, they could probably name three quarters of it. And so there is that kind of sense of, that, that sense of justice around the world is very similar, okay? And so it does apply that there is some kind of natural law background, but that's not really the most accurate 
response, because also you have to put human rights in its political context, that human rights are an internationally agreed standard by states that exist in international law. And they come out of a long process of advocacy and negotiation and debate because they have to see that political context. They can understand why some rights are so contentious, why some rights have so much debate. And particularly around issues, say, with um, abortion, as we see as a big issue, like in the United States and spreading around the world, around sexuality, the rights of LGBTI, that these are rights which are now being debated in politics among states and they're not quite agreed upon. And so, you know, you may find students asking questions about same-sex marriage, and, you know, whether that's a human right. And to understand whether it's a human right, you have to talk about that political scope of human rights, yeah. So that's why I think just that the natural law definition is good, but in order to kind of teach human rights at university, they've got to understand about that political context of states, international law and treaties, and that advocacy process as well, to see that human rights is not just this static idea. It's like the human rights that we have now are different than 10 years ago, different than 50 years ago. Human rights are, human rights are dynamic and changing according to our changing society. And that's why they need to have that political um, definition. Now, also in terms of rights, it's then important when they we need to talk about the definition is to distinguish human rights from citizens' rights, consumer rights, student rights, um, and you know other kinds of rights like that. So they can see that there are a variety of human, sorry, they can see there's a variety of rights, and human rights are a special category of those. Now, how I do that in most classes is one of the first exercises to get them in groups and just say, list down every human right that you know. And nowadays you've got to say, and you can't use Google, you know, you can't use the internet, just every human rights that you know, and they, you know, sit together and they write a list. And you find if you've got a group of like four or five undergraduates, in about five minutes, they'll all list about 10 or 15 rights. And most of those are pretty accurate as well. Okay, and so then you, you can just write them all up on the board, get them to call them out. And as they put up the rights, you can discuss the rights. It's a good kind of, um, what do you call it, ice breaking exercise where they can sit in groups, a brainstorming exercise. And you also get a sense about their level of knowledge of rights and also misinformation when they start calling out things which aren't actually rights. This is just a slide that I use. So the simple definition, human rights, the rights that one has because they're human, the complex one, rights are an internationally agreed standard on how shape state should respect people in its territory. But that second one just shows about, we, we have the context of states, standards or treaties, and then the, then the territory or territorial application there. Uh, I mean, if you want, you can go into more detail about universal jurisdiction, but that's a bit too early in the class. Right? And by talking about people in its territory, you're avoiding talking about citizens there. It's just that people under the power of that government should get these rights no matter what. Now, the really difficult part is explaining rights because students have to have a basic knowledge of what a right is. And it's difficult because like all students know what a right, they know the basic understanding of a right and they know, uh, you know, basically what it means. How it works when you try to, when you say to a student, what makes a right a right? They have real difficulty explaining that. And even I did until I started teaching a course where I thought more about what actually makes a right a right? Why do we have rights? And so I'll look at that in the next slide, but that can be a, a quite a, a challenging, but it is also quite an important concept that they can grasp. Um, also, in terms of looking at how rights work, it's important to get this distinction about how to or get this idea of how rights are protected. You know? The promotion of rights is quite easy because that's just, you know, teaching people about rights. But the protection of rights is important to teach. And that explains how states have to protect rights, but also 
parents protecting the rights of their children to say education or um, in the family, people protecting their rights so there's no domestic violence or teachers protecting the rights of students and their freedom of expression and so on and so on. Looking at everyone has a duty to kind of respect other people's rights. And by respecting those rights, you're protecting them as well in a sense. And then explaining rights to the community, national, regional, and international level. And as Aisha gave in that good example, you can see that it can be useful to talk about national level human rights, uh, you know, through things like constitutions. But even in the community, like it's good early on if students see that human rights work in the classroom, in their home, among their friends, on the bus, uh, you know, going home. All those kinds of things that you see human rights has to work in a community as well. It can be useful to see that there are, um, you know, there is a mechanism, say, at the ASEAN level. And then international human rights in the UN. Okay, so just to, three kind of important bits of content there, explaining what a right is, explaining protection, and explaining the levels at which a right works. Now, as an example, I use this formula to explain the components of a right. But this is kind of a well-known like formula within, um, within law explaining the components of a right. Because the, in order to understand a right, we have to see a right only occurs when there's a relationship between a rights holder and a duty bearer. If there's no duty bearer, you don't need that right. Like there's no right to gravity because no one has to provide gravity for us. But there is a right to clean air. You know, the state and business has to make sure the air is clean. They can't pollute the air, so there's a duty bearer there. So whenever you have some kind of right or something which should be guaranteed for you, what's something which should be protected for you or some freedom that you have, there is always someone else who has to respect that right. Yeah. And that's why rights exist. Rights exist to protect people from other people violating from other people you know violating their rights if there's no one else no one that can violate their rights then it, you don't need a right there yeah. okay and so in this formula you can run through this relationship between the rights holder and the duty bearer explain the different types of duty bearers and explain that students themselves are duty bearers that the duty bearer legally is the state but it's also husbands and parents and um, nurses and teachers and bus drivers and police and um, uh, uh, companies and so on and so on all these all these um, uh, bodies can be duty bearers now when it comes to the reason for a right this where it gets a little bit philosophical and it can be a little bit tricky but this is where you can say say for human rights you know the reason you have that right is because you're human, or you have that right to ensure that we live in a world of dignity. So it's those kinds of moral reasons there. But this, this formula is also useful because you can say give exercises of like, you know, when you get a taxi, when you get in a taxi and that taxi driver should take the shortest route to the destination. In that relationship between you and the taxi driver, Who's the rights holder? What's the right? Who's the duty bearer? And what's the reason? And so you can give a whole lot of examples like that of any kind of right. What's the right for a student to be able to talk, ask a question in a class? What's the right that when you pay for your lunch that the food is going to be nice or edible? All those kinds of things you can say, like in this case, in the taxi, you're the passenger is the rights holder and the taxi driver is a duty bearer and you have the right to go on the shortest route. And that reason for that right can be like consumer rights. That as a consumer, you've kind of got a contract with that driver to drive the um, shortest route. Same thing when you buy lunch, you're the, the buyer of the lunch, that's the restaurant. And the right is the right to clean food. And the reason again, could be something like consumer rights or student rights. You know. The student is a rights holder, the duty, the duty bearer is the teacher. The right could be the right to ask questions or the right to get feedback on your assignment. And the reason for that right is because that's what makes education effective, for example.
key concepts. So I've listed here what I think are the kind of the key concepts, but of course this can vary according to your class and your interests and the specialization. So there may be more legal concepts if it's in a faculty of law or more political concepts, say democracy and peace and justice, if it's uh, political science or if it's philosophy. But I think uh, these four at the top here have to be addressed. Inherent, inalienable, dignity, and universal. Because these appear, appear in the very start and the early parts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is what makes human rights different from any other form of human rights. So human rights that are inherent mean you always already have human rights. You're born with human rights. You don't have to earn them. If you're a human, you have human rights. That's the only qualification. So they are inherent. And that's an important one. You know, and that was the big jump that the Universal Declaration made, which made you know, post-1948 human rights different to any other form of human rights. The idea that they were inherent and universal. Okay, Every human has human rights. Uh, then we have the concept of inalienable, which means that human rights can't be taken away. Now, inalienable can be a bit tricky because we know that individual rights can be taken. You know, like during COVID, or a person goes to jail, uh, they can lose some of their rights. But inalienable means that a human can't have their human rights taken away. Like a right can be taken away. You go to jail, you lose the freedom of movement. But prisoners are always humans, and prisoners have human rights. Yeah. So that's an important concept there, inalienable. Dignity and to lead a life in dignity is also important as like an objective of human rights. Um, again, that's it's a, a concept which is very, I'd say fuzzy, very, there's no kind of clear definition of it. And it's a more of a natural law concept that people should be treated well. But I guess that's just what, you know, you can discuss that in class, what dignity means in your community or your, your um, state, your country. And then universal means that all humans have human rights no matter where they are. And this is the big, the big thing that, the big concept that divides post-1948 human rights with pre-1948 human rights or pre-universal declaration human rights. Like before with all the constitutions and the, the rights of man from France and the civil the Bill of Rights in, in England, all those kinds of, all those rights that existed in those constitutions are not universal. They are limited by country and by constitution and by nationality. Sometimes are limited by gender or by ethnicity. It wasn't until 1948 that the idea that humans have rights was kind of put into existence with the Universal Declaration. Okay, we've kind of covered rights and duty bearers. Uh, then the ideas of rule of law, non-discrimination, equality, interdependent, indivisible, and interrelated. Those are all important, but maybe whether you put them in the first class would depend on the level and what you want to cover. This is a difficult issue to address because we know that there are Right, religious rights, freedom of expression, and rights to culture, which they should respect um, those kind of religious values. But also, we know that you can't use your rights to justify violating other people's rights. So, for example, you can't use your freedom of expression to, to invade other people's privacy. Like, you shouldn't be talking about other people's secrets, or you shouldn't be talking about private affairs with other people. Um, so you can't use your freedom of expression to justify violating those rights. And that's, in these early classes, that's a typical approach that I use when they talk about religious rights. And they're saying religion, you know, there's definitely a right to religion, but that doesn't give religion the right to violate other people's rights. Now that covers most of it, but not all of it. You know? So for example, the one, the one that I find the most difficult 
is that when some people say, well, why can't women be monks in Thailand? Don't they have that right? Um, and that's a difficult one because you have to, in some sense, you have to respect that Buddhism in Thailand has this long tradition of uh, men, only men being monks. And it's a very kind of patriarchal decision that only men can do this. But to then kind of try and justify, well, women should be monks as well through human rights is going to be quite, quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I've kind of said, what I've said there is there are, there are ways to kind of um, explain it, but also at some level, uh, in some ways, you just can't answer those questions, I think. You know, in, there are some things where clearly, uh, you know, religion can be a violation of rights, where, say, they don't, uh, like in some places where women may not get the right to vote, women not, may not have the right to drive a car. If you look at some of the, the very conservative values, or girls can't go to school, those are kind of easy questions saying, well, in that case, that religion is just doing something wrong, yeah? But in some cases, it's going to be much more of a balance where there's no answer. So I'm not quite sure if that's a good enough answer to help you, but um, that that may give you um, that that's my perspective on it. Now, as a way to explain these concepts, I I've, I've been using this example recently, and I think it's quite a good one to get the discussion going. That you give this example and you ask if this is a human rights violation. Women in Indigenous community faces violence at home from the husbands. It's been happening for generations. It's a part of their culture and the social position of women, and they accept being hit by their husbands. They say it's private. The women never complain, and besides, there's no one to turn to in the community as everyone accepts domestic violence as normally. And culturally, the wife believes her husband is allowed to hit her, and so she does not report him to the police. And this, you know, it's, uh, it's a position that most students can relate to. The question then is, is this a violation of human rights? We know it's wrong in that community. That community sees it as a part of their culture and part of their tradition. But does that mean it's a human rights violation? So you can see much like those more difficult questions about religious values, this is similar because it's, it's putting traditional cultural uh, culturally traditional values against human rights values. Now, when I asked it, so I, I also asked them to, to put into practice the concepts of inherent and alienable universal and dignity. Like in your answer, use these concepts. So the good thing about this, it kind of twists them a bit so they're going to answer in a more human rights way. Because when they try talking about inherent, it means that they're going to answer that, well, that woman does have inherent human rights or inalienable, just because a woman is a part of that culture doesn't mean that her rights can be taken away in terms of not facing domestic violence. Or universal, even if they're part of this tradition of this indigenous culture, they still should have human rights. And then dignity. Is she living a life of dignity if she is facing domestic violence? Okay. So, you can see in this one that students then have to start engaging with this um, this sensitive issue or this this challenging issue of culture versus human rights. What do you think of this this case? How would you see that students would answer it? A real life one, which is in, which is kind of challenging and interesting, is in the. Uh, the organization in um, Latin America. And this one appeared before the uh, Inter-American Human Rights Court was that some indigenous communities in the Amazon forest, they practice infanticide, which is killing of young children if they have a disability. Because living in the Amazon is very harsh and these, these groups, you know, they just can't look after disabled kids. And so they leave them to die this is at a young age in, in the jungle. And they say this is part of their culture and tradition and they've done this forever. But a, a court, a case was taken, I'm pretty sure it was taken to the Inter-American um, Court of Justice, I forget exactly what it's called, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. 
where they said no, that the, uh, the state has a duty to protect those children, that those Indigenous groups should not be allowed to kill those children and rather they should be taken into care. But again, it was a debate around similar things like this, Indigenous um, traditions. Now, if you want to get much more um, challenging, then you could look at some more contemporary religious values, say, like the ones about, say, women not being monks in Thailand. But that would be harder to teach because, uh, because the, the sides are so even that you wouldn't, wouldn't get a clear answer to this. But in this case, you can talk about, I think in this case, there's a few important things that can be unpacked or that can be kind of um, discussed with the students. And one is that this idea of culture and tradition, that just because it's culture and tradition doesn't mean it always has to be like that way and doesn't mean it always has to be right. Because remembering in the CEDAW convention that CEDAW says, I think Article 4 or Article 5, I can't remember which one, but it says that that state should try and modify culture so that they comply with the general equality between men and women. And at first, people say, well, that sounds terrible. Like, Why would you go in and interfere with culture? Why would you try and modify culture? Isn't that a bad thing? But then important to remind students that, that culture is a dynamic and changing thing. The culture of their parents and grandparents are different to their own culture as will be the culture of the next generation, the culture of their children. You have to accept that cultures modify and change. And if cultures modify and change, we should change them to be better. That's the whole point of humanity. We change the cultures to be better and to be fairer and to be more just and to be more peaceful. And so it's a process of living in a community that we want to change our cultures to be better. And as we know that this has happened with say domestic violence against women, most, cultures and societies tolerated violence against women, but now they don't anymore. Like amongst the kids today in your class, none of them would think that domestic violence is justifiable. They would all see it as wrong. And so that's part of this kind of change in cultural tradition as we see here. Here's an important point here that when you talk about because that woman being brought up in that culture is taught that that culture is the truth, is reality. And that, you know, the education is important, um, important way to show that, no, there are alternatives there, that she doesn't have to be hit. So human rights and human rights education is a very important part of this. Yeah, yeah good point there. Because what I'm talking about here really is that first class, like the first two to four hours, or however, you know, the first one, first, um, one to two weeks of the human rights class. And so covering what are rights, the main concepts there and being able to use those concepts is probably enough for that first class. But next important, we look at the process of teaching human rights. And this is how that should be done in the classroom. Now, what I think is useful is going to this, this model of human rights education, which comes out in the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education which is about, I don't know, five or 10 years old. It's, it's fairly recent. But it says that it gives this model about through and for human rights. And I think this is a useful structure to follow. So it says that when you're teaching human rights, you should be you know, making sure that you cover all three of these. It should be education about human rights, which is the knowledge and the content which we just covered before but also education through human rights, which means the actual process of learning is, is within human rights itself, that human rights are respected in the classroom, that the classroom is a democratic space. And finally, human education for human rights, which means that when that student leaves the classroom, that they're gonna be human rights advocates. They're gonna ensure that human rights are brought to their community or when they engage with their, their family and their friends and their community, that they do it in a, you know, that they're using human rights in that way. So what that kind of looks like is in, in terms of the classes. So about human rights is of course the content which we just covered. Through human rights, the classes are rights-based and use the main concepts of human rights. And that's where I'm gonna ask you a question 
this is at the bottom here, what rights are relevant in the university classroom? That the objective is, is that students promote and protect rights in their work and community, family and social group. And this is just simple things like they you know, make sure that students aren't racist, there aren't sexist, that students say, you know, male students protect women or they're more um, knowledgeable about non-citizens and their rights or all those kinds of things which, which students can practice in their everyday life to make their life, um, uh, you know, uh, to make their, their life about their respective human rights. But coming back to the, this question, what are the relevant rights in a human rights classroom? Great, a very important one, that students know that there's a freedom of expression. They should be able to, they should be able to express themselves and that people aren't gonna tell them to quit, keep quiet and that, um, that all students can speak. Freedom of choice, it depends on the choice of, of what? So this is, this is a right that you find in the US constitution, but yeah. not so much in a human right. Yeah. So we have rights to say, choose our religion, choose where we live, choose our work. There are those can you know, choose what we study. So those choices. And so we can talk about that in the class in terms of you know, students' rights to choose um, uh, what subjects they, they, um, they study. So there, is, there are some elements there. And that's another important one, like students, all students in the classroom should be treated equally, regardless of their gender, sex, nationality, the color of their hair, their political opinion, their what type of music they like, or what type of clothes they wear, or whatever. And that you can you know, talk to students about, you know, that we should all, that as students, you should be all treated equally by the teacher. And it's also important then to say, but students and teachers are not equal. Yeah, that as a as a teacher, as a lecturer, you have kind of different rights and different duties. So there's not equality between students and lecturers, but there is an element of non-discrimination there. That because you're the teacher, you can't use that to discriminate and to mistreat people. There is the right to privacy, say with the students' grades and things like that, and the students have private conversations. Of course, there's the right to education itself. There is the freedom of movement that students have the right, you know, when you're in the classroom, you can discuss the freedom of movement is do they have the right to leave the class at any time or should they stay in the classroom? I mean, even freedom of religion, if people want to wear certain clothes or have their own religious beliefs, uh, right to culture as well. So all those are elements that you can talk about with students saying in this classroom, you should be um, respecting human rights, and that means freedom of expression, non-discrimination, and so on. Next is that we all tend to work from um, Bloom's taxonomy. That's like the ASEAN standard in terms of, you know, how we structure these classes. And just in the early classes, this is some example of how we can use that taxonomy in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So we want them to like remember the definition of human rights and even remember some human rights themselves. This is the very lowest level. They should walk out of the class remembering what the human rights, remembering what human rights means. And they should be able to understand why we have human rights and understand what basic human rights means in terms of inalienable and inherent. But more than understand, they should be able to explain, and this comes up to the next level, to explain those concepts like inherent and universal. And that's why those examples of say, indigenous groups and child marriages, you know, apply this concept to this case study. And then you can see, can they explain the concept of inherent and universal? Or can they explain the basic history and development of human rights, you know, up to the universal declaration and beyond that? Okay, the next level up is they're applying and analyzing. And this can be done through case studies where you can give them like a tricky case study and say, well, is this a rights violation or not? And you can see them looking at the case study and kind of going through and choosing which rights are relevant and then trying to determine is that a rights violation or not? And then evaluation where they have to engage in debates. And this can be around religion and rights. Whereas we'll come to you soon, are human rights Western? Are human rights important? 
what makes a right a right. For example, in Myanmar, the, the case that, that I sometimes use is that in the university dormitories, the curfew for women is 7 p.m. So female students have to be back in the dormitory at 7 p.m. But males can go back to the dormitory at 10 p.m. And is that a human rights violation? So if they can explain that, you know that they're at that level to apply and analyze, maybe even evaluate human rights. Because they have to talk about, well, there's definitely a distinction there between men and women and the dormitories. But does that mean that there's a violation of rights? Because women go back at seven o'clock, are their rights being violated? So they can talk about, say, freedom of movement. They can talk about if women go back at seven o'clock, are they missing out things which the, may, which the boy students get? And that can be that the boys can sit in the library for longer or they can go out and socialize and, be, uh, and, and you know, have a party with their friends for longer. But is that a, a violation of human rights? Okay, I'll go into the last section. This is dealing with challenges in the first class. And this is where we, we come back to those issues around religion and the very first question about, you know, students today not seeing that human rights are important. We know that one of the challenges of human rights is that it deals with sensitive issues, say criticizing governments, which can be sensitive in some countries, addressing religious or traditional sensitivities, Things like religious values, um, sexuality can be quite a sensitive topic in some places as well, like lesbian, gay, and transgender. And also kind of cultural beliefs around women's equality, non-citizens, ethnicity, racism, and things like that. Okay, so in terms of how to do this, and some of the key features from these challenge, difficult questions, is I think firstly, an important standard is to be, is to kind of what you call like manage expectation, to be realistic about human rights. Many students think human rights are there to solve the problems of the world. You know? And they can, they can be part of that solution, but human rights alone you know, aren't, aren't gonna solve the world's problems. And, you know, human rights, uh, students often get this long list of all these violations are happening, but human rights is doing nothing about it. You've got to be realistic about what human rights and human rights protection mechanisms um, can achieve. So that's one way to be realistic, saying, well, those are big problems, but those problems are economic and they're political and they're cultural and uh, um, yeah, community-based and all those things. And human rights can contribute to that, but there's a lot of stuff that has to happen. The next thing to do with, that you can do with tricky um, questions is to go back to the, the treaties themselves. And this is, I mean, it's a bit of an easy answer. But you just go back and say, look, this is what the right is. This is how it exists. And this is what should be applied. And really then it's up to the states um, to apply it. And then we have like another way is to manage a debate between students themselves. So often you'll find in terms of women's equality that Obviously, the women students are going to have different ideas than the male students. And it can be, it can be a bit tricky, but you can manage a debate between those, those two groups. Um, it's risky because it can sometimes go wrong in some cases if the students are very, um, very uh, active. But that's one way to be, uh, one way to manage that in the classroom. So the CRC does address violence against children, a protection of children and also managing children who may have faced this trauma. Like the actual management of the trauma in children itself, like it's not explicitly written down as a human right, but you know, children do have the right to health. Children do have the right to be free from violence. And so it's implied that children should be protected and the survival of the development of the child is paramount. And so human rights do form the basis of that. That, but how that's implemented will depend on the social welfare system and how trauma is managed in those um, uh, in the health system there in the country. So definitely, children should have a right to that kind of that kind of health. Um, but in terms of being explicitly in the CRC, you know, it's not clearly there. Okay, now coming back to this question, what are the difficult questions that you face in the classroom? 
Childhood trauma is going to be a result, almost certainly, of a human rights violation. Human rights can try and address what the problem is that's causing that, whether it's violence against children or the detention of children or sexual exploitation of children. So you can address that. But in terms of knowledge and responding to that, that trauma is best done in another discipline, I think. In terms of how to address that, that's probably not a good thing to do in a human rights class because it's much more better suited to say psychology or welfare classes. There are specific techniques about or specific knowledge about how to deal with child, childhood trauma. We can all relate to that. We know it's sometimes you have a class and then you kind of ask for questions or ask them to respond and they're all dead quiet. How do you, anyone, how do you respond to that? What do you do? Because you find the bigger the class, the lower the participation. And also the bigger the class, you just tend to find if there is participation, it's the same students who participate. So what I tend to do, like if a class gets say above 30 people, I don't tend to have one-on-one -on -one participation. I just say, talk to the person next to you. So you give a question or a case, say, okay, this is the question. Talk to the person next to you for a minute and discuss it. And then at the end, some volunteers can kind of uh, talk about what they discussed. And that's that's a good way because a couple of things happen. Like everyone talks and everyone talks to the person next to them. But also by talking to the person next to them, they gain a bit more courage to talk as well. And so often you can say, uh, yeah, like you know, talk to the person next to you about this topic. And you will find three or four people talk as well. So it does encourage participation. And you can do this in classes of you know, up to 100 students. It can be a bit noisy if they're all talking, but I think the noisy class can be good. What, what, I, what you should not do is point out a student and make them answer a question. That's, that's kind of the worst way because it just makes that student terrified. It makes all the other students really terrified in the class. If, if we're talking here about a big undergraduate class of say 40 plus students, picking out a student and making them answer a question can just be really quite terrifying for some students. So, so I'd never do that. This is, this is a, can be a, a sensitive one. Like in Thailand, it's not bad at all. Like even like the, the human rights class I'm teaching uh, this semester, I think there's, there's one transgender student, maybe two, I'm not quite sure but it's so much part of the society here. So it's not that much of an issue. But in some other places, both within the country and the politics and then within the classroom, there can be that level of discrimination or level of um, being unsure about it. Now, a couple of things there is I think that- They're way more liberal about that in terms of the social media, in terms of pop culture, that transgender is not so much a challenging thing. And so it's getting to be less and less of an issue. But still, it can be a sensitive issue because you're dealing with some groups of people who say, well, if you're transgender, there must be something wrong about it. When we know that transgender has occurred all throughout history in most societies, and it's, um, you know, we know it comes from uh, a gender gender dysphoria. So it's it's a you know it's a status that, that transgender people have, but in no way does it mean that they're not human. And in no way does it mean that they're not uh, you know they're not the same as everyone else. So I tend to if I do face that, I'd just say, well, you know, do you think transgenders are, are human? And if they are human, they should get human rights like everyone else. And that's the kind of easy part. But then the difficult part is when I start talking about well what about transgenders and going to the bathroom or other kinds of sexually, you know, sexual Im immorality of being transgender. Those ones are a bit more difficult to, to answer, but uh, there's, a, there's a few things there, like, like on, the, on the one level, it's important to show that transgenders are, are no more um, sexually immoral than the average heterosexual person. So there's no difference there. Many transgenders see themselves as heterosexual. They see themselves as having like the same sexuality as everyone else. And so, you know, they, in that sense, they are 
you know, common like everyone else. Um, but it is, I mean, you are right that it is difficult trying to trying to convince students or convince people that this is not a threat. This is a part of society. And if they're human, they should be respected like everyone else. A lot of that does come out of the, the politics of that country. Because it, it's, uh, it's useful to look at, say, countries like Thailand and Indonesia and, uh, and the Pacific Islands, where transgenders have been a long part of the culture without too much, well, I mean, there's still discrimination there. There's still, uh, yeah, still maybe not too fairly and equally with everyone. It's still, they are kind of recognised in society and among many communities that, that seem to be trying. So seeing that, so reminding students that when there is that kind of strong backlash against them, often there is some politics behind it. Yeah, so there's a couple of issues which have to be explained here, because one is that, like some people do have more rights than other people. So for example, children have more rights. So there are categories where there are special groups of rights and that's you know, disability or children or migrant workers have their own categories of, of rights. But that's because they also face special vulnerabilities. We are vulnerable to violence as are women, as are people with disability. So that's, that, that's an important thing to discuss around um, universality, that students often think that universality means the same. Everyone has the same rights, but people don't have the same rights. Even in the classroom, you've got women and men. Women have women's rights. You may have citizens and non-citizens. We're going to have slightly different rights. That your the specific set of rights that you have are going to depend on who you are and what you are and where you are. So that's an, an important there. So there are going to have groups that have those rights. Now, but the the next challenge there is when you you may have some groups who think because we're this special group, we should have these special rights or privileges. And that was like the case before, before about this indigenous group, which may say, because we're indigenous, we have the right to perform domestic violence. And that's a challenge because you've got to say that, but no, you are right doesn't give you the right to violate other people's rights. When you look at like legal equality versus substantive equality. So legal equality where there's a law which just says that people are equal versus trying to put in place things like positive discrimination. We are trying to give substantive equality to make sure there's a quality of access and a quality of outcome as well. Because the easy one there is to say that there is, there's no law like all the laws say that men and women can equally be politicians, but why are most politicians men? What, what keeps them out? And that's the difference between substantive equality, like there aren't the same number of female politicians versus just equality in law, but there's no law keeping women out. <laughs> revenge. So but is revenge a human right? I mean, you don't have a right to revenge, but also, Revenge is, is an emotion, it's not in law. Now, there is a right to justice. Yeah, so there's a right that if someone does something to you, you should be able to seek justice. But that justice and the sanctions that, that person faces should be decided by an equal and a fair court system. Yeah. And so revenge is just, not, not a human right, but justice is. We should all face justice. And part of that justice, say, if we look in, in Myanmar, transitional justice period in the future, that you'd expect there to be sanctions and punishments for all the crimes and violations that have occurred in the, um, the coup in Myanmar. The kind of the common misperceptions and questions about human rights that I find occur in classes uh, one, that human rights are Western and that they're a foreign kind of imposition. But this one is not too difficult to, um, uh, to challenge because if you go back and look through the history of human rights, you see like from the UDHR, the, the, you know, the drafting was quite global, people from all around the world. 
in terms of when human rights first appeared in the 1960s, it was very much an Asian and an African thing. At the Bandung Conference here in Southeast Asia and Indonesia, where Asian African countries got together and had their formed the, um, the non-aligned movement, the very first paragraph of their outcome document was that as Asian and African countries, we recognize and respect human rights because human rights was important for them. And that was in the 1950s. And the very first treaty, the ISO treaty was there because Asian and African countries wanted to get rid of racism because that was seen as a European thing. Okay, so this idea that human rights is Western can be quite easily refuted that it is more global. The next one, and this comes back a bit first to the question that was that in the very start about that, that so many human rights, or maybe, actually maybe not quite like this, but there are so many human rights violations, what's the point of having human rights? Or conversely, my rights are fine, so why are we worrying about them? So both of these are very, um, you know, either seeing human rights as a failure or human rights as unnecessary. So in terms of the so many human rights violations, what's the point of having human rights? You can just answer that in the same way you say, well, there's so much crime. Why do we have criminal laws? It's the same thing. We have criminal laws because there is so much crime. We try and reduce it. We have human rights laws because there are so many violations that we're trying to reduce it. Then the idea that human rights are used by criminals and terrorists to escape justice. And again, this is one of the the difficulties with human rights, because you are arguing that no matter how bad a person is, no matter if these are child murderers and they're terrible people, they're still humans and they still demand a fair trial, innocent until proven guilty and those things. But it's important to have that because if we start taking it away from these terrible criminals, what happens next? Who next loses their rights? And so human rights have to be kind of absolute. If you're human, you have them, no matter how bad you are. Uh, then challenges around, say, here it's like around gender, because you can still find that in some situations, males in particular do themselves, see themselves as different, maybe sometimes superior to women. And it's always a challenge to see that women are going to be different, but that does not mean they should be treated unequally. Okay. And the last one being locked in a prison that does not take away your human rights. We, I've mentioned that before. You know, prisoners are still humans. In terms of dealing with common misinformation, uh, mis, yeah, misinformation or misperceptions. So one is to think that everything is a human right. Like, you know, I have, uh, I have a human right to, um, you know, to go to a party tonight, or I have a human right to drink alcohol. You know, those, those are not human rights. So one is also in these early classes, making sure to reduce the idea of just because it's a right, does it make it a human right? That there are human rights are a small subsection of rights in total. Also, what can happen with students is they say, but you know, what about my rights? I have this right to this. Don't I have a right to live in a country where there are no foreigners? It's important that students can start seeing that they've got to balance their rights with the rights of others. You can't justify your human rights to violate other people's rights. Now, another important misperception is that students often quote US constitutional rights, like the rights to bear arms, as human rights. That's because, you know, through pop culture, that many students know some of these basic rights in, in, in the United States as a part of the constitution. You have to remember that, remind them that no, this is an American constitutional right. It's not a human right. And that can happen around things like Miranda rights or, you know, being, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be held against you. Like that, that stuff that you see on the Hollywood um, 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 to, um, police shows is a constitutional right in America. It's not a human right. They're just moral things. They're not, they're not enforceable. It's important that they, that they know that they are part of treaties and they are legally enforceable. And also to ensure that human rights are for humans and not for citizens as well. In terms of that very first opening class, actually, that, if it's like a two-hour class, 
everyone sitting down and writing human rights can be like a 30 minute exercise, then kind of unpacking or interrogating or questioning these concepts or categorizing the concepts into fundal, fundamental legal rights and so on. And then looking at the, um, this is interrogating the concepts of universal, inherent and so on, and applying that to a case study could make up it, it, that very first two hour class just as a basic guide for a, for a class in terms of how to structure that class. Okay, I'll finish it there.